in church tonight. Amen. You may not look at this as church, but I do. Yes, amen. See, I've traveled all around the world, and there's a lot of places I've been. They'll love to have this facility. I remember a few years ago, I preached the National Convention for the Church of God in Kampala, Uganda, in Central Africa. We had about 15 to 1,700 people there at the National Convention. And it was out in the sweltering heat. Most of the people were able to get under a covering, a canopy. And I had a little brother, he was about five feet tall. His name was Pastor John. He was a black as a lump of coal. Little short fella. We had two or three other brothers that preached and they tried to get under the under the cover. And the people couldn't see them and they got them a microphone and was kindly here. And they'd preach from there. And I thought if I come halfway around the world to preach to these people, I want them to see what I look like. And so I got out there so they could look at me. I want them to see what this fat white boy looked like. <laughs> Come on, brother. And I got Pastor John out there with me. I said, brother, you're going to get out here with me. And I didn't have a microphone. I didn't know if he could keep up with me or not. I put my arm around that little brother there. And I said, folks, look at us. We're twins. Amen. And I meant it. I said, we're twins. And that brother smiled. And he was interpreting for me. And he shouted out, we're twins. <laughs> and he meant it. Amen. Praise the Lord. You see, we're hung up in America. Oh, you're not paying attention. Come on, Brady. I said, we're hung up in America. That's right. Amen. We, we're hung up on so much stuff that we couldn't find God if we wanted to. Oh. Right. When that convention was over on Friday, I wasn't flying out until Monday. And so they invited me to a church there in Kampala to preach on Sunday morning. A church of about 400. I preached the morning worship service. When I gave an altar call, there was a young man walked down to the altar and he had a little cap on. And he knelt in the altar. And he cried and he cried and he prayed. And when he got up, he took that little hat off. And he asked if he could say something. And I didn't realize it, but it was a Muslim cap. And he said, my family told me if I came here today and I become a Christian not to come back home, I would not be welcome. You see, we don't know how easy we've got it. I was learning a lot in my visit to Uganda. They asked me, said, would you like to go to a church in the inner city? In the inner city. Man, I mean, I've been to Detroit and St. Louis and Atlanta. And, you know, I've seen the inner city. They said, no, Kampala, would you like to go to the inner city? 
to church. I said, sure. So they loaded me up. White boy. Lives in Detroit. This was in Atlanta. I'm telling you. We went down some little narrow streets. Cause they weren't streets no more. And they said, get out. We gotta walk the rest of the way. And we walked. People started looking out the windows and the doorways. Weren't you afraid? You no, know, most of the guys that were with me were bigger than Pastor John. We got to the church. It wasn't nothing but a little shack. Hold about 50 people. Had rusted tin on the side walls and they wouldn't enough to cover the walls. Half of the roof, probably not half of it, was covered with rusted tin. If it rained, there was no way the people could be covered. We started service and people were back in that little church. They'd heard the white man was coming and they wanted to see. It started getting dark. I looked around. Finally, they cut the leg lights on. The problem was there was one little 40 watt light Come in on. the middle of the building and it showed that there was only about a third of the roof covered. And I, I couldn't hardly stand it. I'm telling you, it was killing me. Two or three of the preachers got up and they said things, some things, and the pastor got up. He started to cry. And he said, never in my life did I think a white man would come to my church. Let alone come and preach for me. Are you hearing me? Amen. Are you hearing me? I felt six inches tall. I felt like I was in the presence of a world. I had a title. I was the only man there who had a title. I took my tie off and I walked up to him while he was speaking and I wrapped my tie around his neck and those people stood and clapped for me and for him like we were two rock stars. I want to tell you something church. We are blessed in America. Amen. We are blessed. So don't you feel like that we have lowered ourselves any at all being in this tent meeting. We have elevated ourselves and sent a message to this city. The church is still 
a powerful voice for God. Amen. Amen. Now that was my little commercial. <laughs> The Apostle Paul was a very strange and controversial man. Even the church didn't know what to do with him. He went about and even some of the people in the church looked at him and some of the Jews said he is a man that puts forth strange gods. And in Acts chapter 17 they took him to Mars Hill and I've been to Mars Hill. And he was not allowed by the Greek laws to introduce another God. No one was. And so they had put up a statue with an inscription to the unknown God. And I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to ask you a question. Which God are you talking about? Come on. Which God are you talking about? This is a question that man has wrestled with since the days of Abraham. God spoke to Abram in the year of Chaldeans in the land of ancient Babylon and said, get up and get out. Leave your kindred. Leave your people. And he did. And his family began to travel. And we know the story. Abraham became his name. Amen. And he begat Jacob. And Jacob, Isaac, and then Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph and his brothers. And Joseph went down into Egypt. Amen. And down in Egypt, he began to talk about the gods of the Egyptians. And God began to talk to the children of Israel about don't begin to serve the gods of the Egyptians. Come on. And we get that language. And then when they began to leave Egypt and they began to wander in the wilderness, God warns the children of Israel not to serve the gods of the people in the land. After they cross with Joshua into the promised land, God warns them not to serve the gods of the land, of the promised land. And yet we know that they do. All down through history, God had to warn the children of Israel, don't serve those gods. Amen. It was a constant battle. Don't serve those God. We come down to Elijah. When he went up on Mount Carmel. And he went to the battle. And he said, if Baal be God, serve him. If God be God, serve him. Come on. It become a choice. And of course, we know how that turned out. And the battle still raged on. 
On it, it went. And it's still raging. Which God are we talking about? Well, it's simple. Well, if it is, why isn't everybody serving the right God? Why isn't everybody serving the same God? Is anybody listening? Is anybody paying attention? Amen. How many gods are there out there? One. Well, why isn't everybody serving Him? The truth of the matter is, there's a lot of gods out there. There's only one right one. There's only one true God. There's only one living God. There's only one powerful God. There's only one God that's mighty to save. Come on, bro. So we come on down. Even to the days of Jesus. They began to question him. They asked him the question, are you the one? Are you the one? Even John the Baptist. After he had been revealed to John the Baptist. John the Baptist got thrown in prison. He sent some of his disciples to Jesus. He said, are you the one or do we, should we seek another? Got confused about it. So we go on. We call Apostle Paul. Now, here he is in Mars Hill. The unknown God. No. The battle rages. Now we come down to our generation. I was on a plane flying over to India. Had a flight attendant serving an unusual ring on his finger. I stuck up a conversation with him. I said, young man, I said, that's an unusual ring that you have on your finger. I said, you mind sharing with me what it represents? He said, oh, that's my God. I said, you mean it represents your God? He said, no. That's my God. He was Hindu. That is my God. And I looked at him. And a crazy thought went through my mind. Come on, brother. I hope you don't take that ring off and it fall in the commode and flesh it down. <laughs> I hope, I hope your God is not that tangible Come on, man. that you can lose it that easy. Come on, right. I had a lady that come to our church, used to come to our church. They moved away not too long ago. She sat in a restaurant one day and she told me, she said, Oh, you know, Allah and Jehovah are the same. I said, Oh, no, they're not. But it would surprise you how many people sit in Pentecostal churches that have been brainwashed in believing that Allah and Jehovah are the same. Come on, brother. And if you believe that, you're believing a lie. Amen. That's right. You're believing a lie. Right. Which God are you talking about? Come on. Let me tell you which one talking about tonight. I am talking about the one that sits high and lifted up. Come on. <laughs> who sits on the throne of heaven. Right. His name is the Almighty God. Yeah. He is 
the I am. And his right hand is a man called Jesus. He is the father of the Lord. <laughs> Which God are you talking about? I'm talking about the only true and wise God. Right. There's only one. Amen. That is true. There's only one that has all power, has all wisdom, yeah. has all might, is almighty, yeah. all loving, has all grace, yeah. has all wisdom. Yeah. There's only one that loves you. There's only one that gave his only begotten son. There's only one that has a plan of salvation. Amen. Yet, people act as if there's a thousand ways and a thousand gods. Come on. But let me tell you something. One of these days, they're going to wake up and they're going to find out that the God that I'm preaching about tonight is going to make some decisions that's going to upset their apple cart. Come on, brother. He's got right. Because he's calling the shots. That's it. The president's not. That's it. The United Nations is not. No one is. The Supreme Court's not. Amen. Hollywood's not. The Almighty God is. Right. And let me tell you the next thing that's on the agenda. Get ready, 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 get
the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. He told the disciples, He said, I'll not eat this till I eat it fresh with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory. I'll not eat this till I eat it fresh with you in my Father's kingdom. And He'll take the bread and the cup and he'll serve communion to the redeemed of the ages anybody want to take the Lord's Supper to Mary's Supper the Lamb anybody want to be there you know what else he's going to do come on brother there's going to be a feet washing. Somebody said, I don't believe in feet washing. I'm going to tell you something. Bless God, I'll put my feet out there and let Jesus wash my feet. You can keep your pride if you got any when you get there. But I'll let him wash my feet. Come on, bro. Amen. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Well, while we shout around the marriage supper of the Lamb, let's, let, let's, while we're in our halo of glory, let's go back to planet Earth. Let's go back to planet Earth. The sevens. The sevens. Judgments. Judgments. Judgments begin to take place on the earth. The Antichrist comes into power. Peace is taken from the earth. Do you hear me? Mighty men fall. Kings fall. Kingdoms fall. Fires everywhere. Earthquakes everywhere. Men cry for the mountains to hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne. Awful time, awful time. Which God are you talking about? Which one do you want to serve now? You want to serve that man of sin? Which one you want to serve now? Which God you want to serve now? After seven years, after seven years of hell on earth, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I see a white horse. And I see him that sits on the white horse. And his name is Holy and True. Glory. He's clothed and white. His vestures dipped in blood. And it says, I the speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And he comes. He plants his feet on the Mount of Olives. Come on. It splits asunder half to the north and half to the south. And there's a river that splits and goes through it toward the east. It goes through the desert. And the desert blossoms like a rose. 
and the waters of the Dead Sea are healed. Hallelujah. He takes a journey and goes into that great valley of Armageddon. Let me tell you something. It's going to be one of the awful sight this world's ever seen. And those men that come to fight against him, they're going to be vaporized and their eyeballs are going to come out of their sockets because of the glory of his brightness. Which God are you going to serve now? Which one are you going to choose? Wait a minute. He's going to grab the beast and a false prophet. Get an angel to take care of them. Cast them into the bottomless pit. Good man. Said, put it there for a thousand years. I got business to take care of. Amen. He puts him in the bottomless pit. I got to go back to Jerusalem. Wait a minute. I see something coming down. And it's that new new Jerusalem coming down. And while that new Jerusalem's coming down, I see the Old Testament prophetic word being fulfilled. Swing wide, ye gates, ye everlasting doors. The King of Glory's coming in. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord of hosts, He is the King of Glory. Yeah. Remember the prophecy that He gave before Jesus was born? And I shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall rule over the house of Jacob forever. He's getting ready. Amen. To sit upon the throne of his father David. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. And New Jerusalem is a coming down. And we are going to rule and reign for a thousand years on planet earth. God are you talking about? Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. For a thousand years. For a thousand years. But when it's over, when it's over, Satan gets one more shot. One more shot. Which God are you talking about now? Come on. Come on. The sea. And death, hell, the grave gave up the dead which were in them. The righteous are not going to be affected. And those whose names were not written in the book of life. They were gathered at the great white throne judgment. The books were open and the book of life was open. The book of life is not complicated. It's not complicated. Believe what you want to. But it boils down to this. If you make it through to God's good heaven, your name has to be written in the book of life. Amen. Amen. Throw everything else out. To make it into God's good heaven, your name has to be written in the book of life. Amen. You can go to whatever church you want to, or whatever church you don't want to. Your name has to be written in the book of life. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. 
and my one more one it'll break back it'll break back look sorry I never knew you sorry I never knew you sorry I never knew you Sorry, I never knew you. This might be the last message I ever preach. But if it is, whether it's somebody sitting under this tent, or it's somebody that watches this on the internet, I'm here to tell you, God is telling you, you better turn to Him. Come on. You better give your heart and life to Him. You may never have another opportunity. Jesus Christ is the truth. He's the way. He's the only way. Amen. There's no other way. You can't be saved any other way. You got to come through the cross. You got to come through the blood. Right. Nothing can wash your sin away but the blood. Amen. And if the blood doesn't wash your sins away, and your name's not written down in the book of life, when it comes to that great white throne judgment, and your name's not written there with the devil and a false prophet and the Antichrist. You'll be cast into the lake of fire and into hell. Please search the book again. I thought my name was there. I went to church on Sunday. Though I never knelt in prayer, please search. If you're here tonight and you don't know God, it's too late now. I know. I beg of you, search the book again. Make your decision tonight to turn to God. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. In your heart, laugh to God. You may not have a tomorrow. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Come on, Virgin. Oh God. If you got a child that's not saved, you better get on your knees before God. You better get on your knees. I'm telling you, they need to be saved. They need to be saved. You need to pray them through. You need to pray them through. You need to call her name before God. Oh, God. God, don't let our children go to hell. Don't let our loved ones go to hell. If your daddy's lost, you better call his name before God. If your mother's lost, you better call her name before God. If you got a brother or sister that's lost, you better call her name before God. These things about the end. Which God are you talking about? I'm talking about a loving God. But I'm talking about a God that's tired. He's tired. He's tired of what's going on. Man. Yes, he is. Oh, God. Oh, God. 
Oh God, Lord, I pour my heart out tonight. <laughs> They may not be here tonight, but through the prayers of somebody that's here, reach out, reach out, get a hold of somebody, and save them, I pray. Oh God, oh God, in Jesus' name. yourself. Where do, you, where do you stand? Do you just go to church? Do you go through the motions? God help us to turn our hearts to God tonight. And I, I believe every one of us, every one of us, ought to seek the Lord tonight. Come and stand in proxy. Kneel at the altar. Seek God tonight. Come. The Spirit says come. 